Good evening, everybody. Good evening. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. I see a lot of family in the front row. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. Oh, yeah, that's all the Ronsons down there. I've got a I can see it. How are you doing, guys? You all right? Hi. And the lambs are there. Very good. Very good. Hi. So, Mark. Water? Yes, thank you. Um, what was your house like growing up? Was it, was it a musical house? Uh, yeah, actually, my, my dad is here as well. Um, he was a big musical fanatic. He wasn't necessarily a musician, but he loved all the like soul music and Motown, and I'm sure that had a big influence on me, especially like the stuff I did later when I met Amy and Version and all the horns, and I'm sure that had a lot to do with why it's such a soft spot for that music. But um, I guess, uh, yeah, I played drums from a young age. And okay, you got. Was you, you were four years old when you got your first drum kit? Is that right? Yes. Oh, you've been Googling I've been me. doing lots of Googling, mate. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, so when I was a kid, my, uh, my parents were a little wild in their youth, and they would have these, uh, they would have these late night soirees over at the house, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and stumble down. And uh, see, he looks like a rock and roller, my dad. I was right? say, um, handsome old devil. Yeah. Um, I would come down to the speakers, like sit by the speakers in the middle of the night when they're playing music, and I was play, pretend I was playing a drum kit. And I think the rumor has it, this is my, as my mom says, that Keith Moon was there. It, I, if you check out the dates, he might have been dead for a few years. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, about it's that a better point, story if Keith yeah, Moon was it, there. It was somebody. So, uh, and he said, oh, that kid, uh, whose kid is that? As if there were just other kids walking yeah. in off the street. Like <laughs> 3 a.m. Uh, and uh, they said, uh, oh, you should get him a kid a, dr a drum kit. He looks he, like he kind of knows what he's doing. And, uh, and that's, that's how I think it started. And I think that so even Keith though... So Keith Moon got you your first drum kit, is that... The reanimated zombie yeah. ghost of Keith Moon, yeah. No, some, some, my parents got me the drum kit. And I remember sitting along and just playing to all my favorite records. And I also, um, I have really clear memories of my first turntable, it was like a, my first record player, or Sony or Fisher Price, and I remember being really excited the way I just watching the needle like when it would drop on the record and just being really transfixed, so it's crazy that I went into DJing. Yeah, yeah. No, but, uh, yeah. I, read another, I read another story about you uh, sitting, you, you had, there were some tape decks in the house and the speakers were outside and all the adults were outside and you realized if you sat inside you could control the music, yeah. right? Yeah. It's funny, these things that happen when you're a kid and you just like see them as like, oh, I just like putting needles on records or I like controlling music and then obviously they all fall into place. Like you can look back on it, but at the time you're just, you're just a kid. So yeah, I was eight years old and I was DJing at when my mom got remarried, her wedding. And I remember that there was... That was your first wedding DJ set. That was my first wedding gig. Oh, okay. And I was like, how come there was just silence? I was like, in my head, I was like, why is it crazy? There's all these people here and they're not playing any music. There are these speakers outside. And so I went to the tape deck and then I hit play. And then I, it was obvious that like, just by me, this tiny thing pushing play in this living room, like this amazingly loud noise was happening outside and everybody had to listen and in, hopefully enjoy whatever I was playing. And then I remember all night sitting by the, the two tape decks, like trying to get it so there'd be as little silence as possible in between the songs. So, yeah, I was you definitely. You really were DJ. I was a weird kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so then, so we, you can see it's like, it's, you know, it's in its inception, basically. When do you get your first guitar or when do you, when do you start your first band? Um, my first band, so when, so when, uh, when my mom remarried, we moved to New York, yep. and uh, my stepdad was a musician. He was a musician, so he had equipment around the house, and he let us mess around with it. So I formed a band uh, when I was nine for this, to play at the school talent show, right. to play Wild Boys by Duran Duran, which was ambitious, <laughs> um, especially since we never rehearsed all together in the same place. So uh, <laughs> we went on stage, and it was a complete train wreck, and like, but we just thought it was cool and I think everyone really did practice their parts just not in the Separately. same key and not in the same room yeah right. <laughs> what and were I, they called the band 
I, I can't remember, but I do remember very clearly the saxophone player coming out in the middle to play the solo and playing the theme from Fame because it was the only <laughs> thing he knew. Uh, so we came off, and our teacher, Miss Firewell, the fourth grade homeroom teacher in New York, she just reamed into us. She was so unhappy because all the kids were just clapping because even though it was like a horrible mess, it was just cool. We're like you're listening to Chopin and back for bet buck for 45 minutes and we just come out and make this like terrible noise but it just looked cool and she was like you were a disgrace to all these children that spent all their time practicing all this thing and I think like we were put on like some kind of academic or we weren't allowed to use the arts room for a week or something but um, I, uh, I was very much into playing and I, I kept playing I took guitar lessons saxophone lessons and uh, a couple other things and I would just by the time I was 14 or 15, put my first band together, like a, like a band of like musicians, like when you form a band in school, kids who all like the same thing, you're playing all ages, shows and some venues in New right. York. Did you rehearse together, this band? or This band, we rehearsed together a lot, yeah. Right, okay, that's we, good. We realized it was better to do that. And uh, yeah, and it was, uh, it was How a How did that go? Was it, did, were people, was it well received? I, I think it was kind of good. I think, I listen back a couple songs I can kind of remember playing in my head and it's a little cringy, but we would play these all ages shows and we had a cute lead singer so girls would come to our shows and we'd play at these places like uh, Wetlands that were kind of like these legendary New York places where they would let you have an all ages show on a Sunday. So we'd do that and then um, I kind of just had this vision in my head of being some like rock god like Slash or something. I was just going to be like with this low slung Les Paul just being really cool. And I remember telling my friend... The my best bit about this, most people in this room don't know who Slash is. And if they did, the jump from you to Slash is amazing, by the yeah, way. Yeah. It's really... He's the guy from Guns N' Roses with the tall hat and always got a cigarette and curly <laughs> hair. Um, half Jewish, incidentally, Saul Hudson. Right. Um, so, well, maybe then, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so I remember actually talking to my best friend on the phone like when I was like 16 for 15 or something and I was like I was like yeah man I'm gonna it's gonna be so cool I'm gonna be this rock guitar our band's gonna just blow up it's gonna be amazing he was like uh, really and I was like yeah what do you mean he goes well I never really saw you as like a guy like in front of the cra like scenes I always saw you as like a behind the scenes guy like more like a record producer I was like Fuck you, Alex, you don't know me. Just hang on the phone. Excuse the language, sorry. Um, and he was kind of funnily right. Like, I, I, every now and then, because I still see him, and you know, a lot of my school friends are still my best friends, and, and it's funny to think about that time. Like, he was actually probably pretty right. It's bang on, as much as you fight it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and so when did you first start DJing? Then do you, like, when, when was your first proper set of turntables? I guess that was around the same time that I, that I was playing in the band, and I got really into hip hop music in New York, and uh, I started listening to the radio and just becoming obsessed with it and the culture of it in New York. It was a very exciting time. You had like people like, I guess it was the beginning of Biggie and Wu Tang and Tribe Called Quest and Puffy and all this stuff. New York was very like uh, like they had this vital scene. And uh, I started to collect some records and I got some turntables for my graduation from high school. And then I just started, I guess, like pretty early on, just hustling, like walk, going around New York with my tape, with my mixtapes, and like giving them to every club promoter and trying, like, doing anything to, like, you know, no fee was too small, no gig, you know, too, a, a DJ in someone's living room or whatever it was. Because yeah. in the beginning, you're just, you, you're so excited about it, you're having such a good time, you just want to do it for nothing. But it's, I mean, I think that's important. It's not, you know, that's not an easy scene to break into, particularly as a, as a, as a kind of skinny white guy, you know? Yeah. It's, it, it, it yeah, I was, I would think I was persistent. I had a good knowledge of records and old soul and stuff like that outside of the hip hop, like soul and disco, which probably came a lot from my dad's record collection. And, uh, and that was just, um, yeah, and I think like, it was over the course of maybe five or six years that I really got a foothold, but I was working, I was, I was hustling a lot, so I was working quite early, you know? Right. And at the same time going to university, so I was like coming back on the train two or three times a week to, to play gigs at night and right. whatnot. Now, it, it went, I mean, you're, um, 
your rise through the DJ ranks was pretty, you know, incredible, right? And by the, you know, by that, well, you're still DJing now every now and again, but you're like, by that, by that end of that period, you were one of the biggest, you were certainly one of the biggest DJs in New York. Um, and then you started really getting on the kind of, I don't know, for want of a better phrase, the kind of celebrity DJ circuit. Right. right. Um, at what point did you decide, actually, uh, maybe I, I need to start producing records? I think that... Um DJing was never something that I ever, in my mind, was like a life, an end goal or a lifetime ambition. It was always for me the idea of making music, playing music. But it really did take off, and it's something that I fell into, and I really enjoyed it, and it was paying my rent, so I got into it. And then I think after about 10 years of, of doing it and being, you know, all of a sudden people like, Puffy and Jay Z taking a notice of me and, and taking me around the world to DJ. You know, they, when they do like Puffy did his first party ever in London at like the what's it called the oh, Cafe de Paris or something. And uh, but I realized I, I was kind of looking around and seeing a lot of my peers and people that came up before me. I mean, after me, like having you know just making records and doing this thing. And I was like, oh wait. I've been trying this for 10, 12 years and not really much going on. So I had a bit of, I wouldn't say like a, a crisis, but I just thought to myself like, okay, well, if I really want to be taken seriously as a producer and not as this DJ and having become this title like celebrity DJ, which is something I never wanted to be anyway, I thought I better just really focus on the music. Right. And um, I never thought, I was, it was never like a thing about like having massive commercial success. I just wanted to make things that I th thought were good and actually have them come out. I mean, I guess that's the starting point for anything. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then, and then you, you started working. What was the name of the lady whose record, the first one you did? Nika Costa. Nika Costa. And that got, you know, there was a couple of, like, uh, you had a really, had a really kind of, uh, like, a, like a stabby kind of, um, a stabby bit at the beginning, yes. and, uh, and and lots of people liked it. And Busta Rhymes came up to you in a club, and James Jay Z came up to you in a yeah. club, and they both were like, "Let me spit on that, right?" Yes, it's quite yeah. a big deal. Yeah, no, it was cool. I mean, obviously, these were my heroes, Jay Z and Busta Rhymes, and like, I was DJing this album release party for Jay Z, and uh, he came, and I I had had this record I just produced, this girl Nika Costa, and I thought. Um, I'll just see if I can slip it in in the set, you know, if I put in the peak of the night and see what people think of it, because I hadn't come out yet. And uh, I'm playing it, and Jay-Z, who had like maybe only talked to me twice in my life at that point, like he hired me to DJ and stuff, but we weren't like having late night chats on the <laughs> phone or anything. So he, uh, he, uh, he, come, he motions me, like, come over, he leans over the booth, and I go, oh, God. I was like, I know what he's going to say. He's like, don't you dare ever play one of your own self-promoting records in the middle of my party ever again, do you mind? <laughs> so I was like, uh, yeah? And he leans and he goes, yo. He goes, yo, promise me, you'll, promise me you'll let me be the cat that rhymes on the remix of that when you put it out. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And many, uh, many phone calls to his assistants were not returned, but still. <laughs> Doesn't matter, he still Doesn't said matter. it. Doesn't matter, he still said it. Bust, you had that moment. Yeah, and Buster Rhymes, this was my first thing that ever came out. And here's like Buster Rhymes, another hero of mine, like, he was like, yeah, he came up to me in the club one night. He's like, yo, you made that like, don't, da do da da Like, he was very excited. And I was very excited. And DJ Premier, another one of my production idols, was like, you know, it was nice. So that record kind of came out and had this big hype. And it was in this Tommy Hilfiger commercial. It was on MTV. Everybody was like, oh, shit, this is going to be like the next big thing. And it came out, and it really wasn't. Like, it wasn't a massive failure. It just was, it wasn't anything like, it was kind of a flop. So I, uh, but what was good is, is that um, it was a good industry first lesson of like, the 101, like, don't believe the hype, you know? It was like, so everybody could be, gassing you, telling you this is going to be the biggest thing, and oh, you can retire after this one. And then it comes out and sells 5,000 copies, and you're like, no, better not retire yet. Yeah. Um, unless it's on a kibbutz, and I'm sure that's expensive. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, so I guess I kind of hit the drawing board again. And you, you, made, you started working on your first record? I worked on my first record, and uh, that was something... Um, it was really exciting, and I got signed to Elektra, this label through Warner, and they, they were excited over the, 
they loved the sound of the Nika Costa record I produced, and so they gave me this deal, and I got to work with a lot of my heroes. I was like 26 years old with like sort of a blank checkbook from a record company, and like you know Sean Paul, Most Def, Jack White, Weezer, uh, you know all these all these rappers and singers I really loved, and uh, and the first single came out. Um, and I had never really, even though I'd grown up here, I had never really, because I spent all my time living in New York, I had never really registered with me what an important part of growing up in England and what that had musically was in my DNA. Because the record came out and kind of tanked in the States, but it had Ooh Wee was a hit here. Yeah. And it was coming back here, and that's when I really reconnected as well with, like, with, my, with the scene in London, with my English roots musically. All of it, and it was it was a really exciting thing because even though it wasn't a massive record, it's part of the reason I came back here and why I was able to be around and meet Lily Allen and Amy Winehouse and this thing that really was what what kicks what really jump started my career. Right. So let's let's talk about that then, because um, there was there was a there was a did versions come in the middle of all of that as well. But we can anyway. You had another record that did very very well as well, kind of in the middle of all of this. Version, yeah. So version basically, I made my first record and it had sort of a hit with Uwe, but wasn't really like, wasn't massive. And I got, I actually got dropped by my label, um, and uh, I was just working on stuff. And it was a little bit like the cliche scene in like the movie where like suddenly the phones don't get, you know, if nobody picks up the phone calls, the same A and R guys that are just feeding you all these like compliments and everything suddenly are like not calling you back, you, you know, I have other friends who make music, you see who's getting the call for the gigs. Yeah. And so I started working on this thing by myself version, which was really because I wanted to have these cover versions of songs by Radiohead and the Smiths and bands that I loved to make them in a way that I could play them for the crowds and the, the clubs that I DJed at, which were more like hip hop and R&B. So I made this Radiohead cover and just really for myself and uh, Giles Peterson and Zane Lowe started playing it on Radio 1. And then that really just kicked off everything for me. And it was, it was a good lesson, too, because it's like, that's, that Radiohead record, I wasn't thinking about the charts. I wasn't thinking about commercial success. I was just making something that I would really want to listen to. And, and, I th and that's kind of like, that's your pure place to get to creatively that you don't really get to. I'd like to think I have that a lot, but I'm, I am thinking about thinking about sometimes charts, trends, what, what somebody's audience is when you're working with an artist and sometimes when you're just working on something because you love it and you want to make it, that when, when you hit it with that, it's, it's often... That's the thing that resonates. Yeah, it often yeah. resonates. It's real recognises real. Yes, exactly. Same thing, with, same thing with Amy, I think, because it was at a point where when I met Amy Winehouse, she was about four years out of... She had been working on this follow-up to Frank for a long time. There wasn't like a massive, she, people really liked it. It was critically acclaimed, the first record. Everyone knew she had this incredible voice, but um, th nobody was like, had insane projections for or whatever, it, like this thing, and she'd been gone for a little while. So when I met her, we just started, I was instantly taken by her. I thought she was so cool and funny, and we, we just met on the street, my old studio, and I came to, to I was coming in at the same time she must have been coming in to meet me. And uh, I said, oh, you're going up to the studio? Because I recognized her. She's pretty iconic already there and like looking. And she said, she said, yeah, I'm going up to Mark Ronson. And I said, oh, cool. I'm Mark. She goes, nice to meet you. I was like, no, I'm, I'm Mark Ronson. She's like, oh, I thought you'd be like an old Jewish guy with a beard. <laughs> like, I think she just maybe sometimes you've just been hearing someone's name for a while, you assume they're older than they're, whatever. She thought I was Rick Rubin or something. But, um, uh, and uh, we went up and we just, she's, I asked her the most simple thing that I feel like every, that you should ask anybody if you're working with who meet the first time, like, what kind of record would you like to make? Like, that seems very common sense to me, but I don't think anyone had really asked her like that before. So she got really excited, played me a lot of 60s stuff and the music she was into. And uh, and it was fun, and we had a very like it was like a bit like a long lost friend or family member. It was in, you know instant. We had a, like a a rapport, and so she went back that night uh, to her hotel. She, I think she was supposed to go back to England the next day. She'd just stay an extra day to meet. And uh, I came up. The I old wanted fella, Mark Ronson. 
Huh? The old Philip Yeah, Martin exactly. Wilson. Yeah. Um, I, uh, it was a good thing I shaved my beard that day. Yeah. She, uh, she, she, I was inspired by all the stuff that she had been telling me about and the music she played. And I, I really wanted to make something that was like going to impress her. That's gonna, she was going to hear and be like, all right, I'm staying. Let's work. So I came up with this piano and like little drum pattern that, that I played her uh, the next day. And she was like, she wasn't like overly effusive, so sometimes she was hard to read. And I'm playing it for her, and she's just kind of like sitting there, like twiddling her thumbs. I'm like, oh, she's on the next plane back. This is not working. And then it kind of finished, and she was just like, I love it. And went, took the little tape recording I made her, and went in the back. There was a little drum room or like a closet in the back of my studio. And she just sat with headphones on and came back in like two hours, and she had written all of Back to Black, like the lyrics, That's everything. Awesome. I still have the sheet of paper uh, on it, and it must have been like a scrap because she had the number of this club promoter on it on the right. side, who she must have met the night before. It was probably like some creepy, like, give me a call. And she had written the lyrics on that, and then his numbers on it, and then there was like a lot of hearts and some stuff. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it was amazing. And I couldn't believe that, A, she written it that quick, that it felt so classic and powerful and I was just suddenly like oh I'm dealing with somebody who's operating on a bit of a different plane than I've been used to. When you I always wondered when you're in the studio and you know obviously when you play something good everybody's like this is good we're in a groove let's go with it but when you hear something of that kind of magnitude like all time hall of fame stuff do the first time you hear it you like whoa whoa okay this is serious. Yeah I think I think just because it felt so lyrically like I think you're never fully like, during a moment everything's happening so fast, I wasn't like, oh, this is like, this is time. Like, now I can I'll retire. Be, yeah. yeah, I'll be sitting talking to George Lamb about this 10 years from now. <laughs> but I definitely, uh, when she said, I'm a tiny penny rolling up the walls inside, I was like, what 23-year-old what is like, right, you know. And then when Love is a Losing Game and like some of those lyrics, and I was really like, um, I was, it was, I was definitely aware that I was working on something kind of special, but it was funny because I just knew that we got wrapped up in it for five days. We just started working. We demoed all the songs that I did on the record. So Rehab, um, Love is a Losing Game, Wake Up Alone, and Back to Black. And then her A&R guy, Darkus, who's now the head of Island, I think, he came out to New York to hear what we'd been working on. And like I said, there was no like massive expectation because it was just like, um, it was pretty like, if it was really massive expectation, they wouldn't put it with me, put it that way, like 28-year-old kid, like sort of unproven. And I remember playing him the opening bars of Rehab, like the opening like five seconds, and it was the demo, but fairly close to what it was. And he, Darkus is like, I think he's Jamaican, he just starts like, it's literally like on the chart to make me go, I said, no, 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 he starts going, boom, 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 like we're at Jamaican Carnival or something. And he's like, rewind, rewind, and I'm like, oh, cool. It was like the first inkling that I had of anything like that, that this might actually, like people beyond just us might like it. Because, I mean, I think that it's like what we're talking about the other thing, when you make something from a place of just like, just because you're so in the moment, it's really honest and it's it's also really nice. To, so he was, he was super into it, and uh, but it didn't really change the what we were doing. We were just kind of like telling Amy's stories, really. Right. And then it came out, and it was a huge success. And you won. Was it your first Grammy you won with that? Yeah. First of five, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what does that feel like winning a Grammy? Uh, it's pretty crazy because it's something that I didn't ever really think like was probably even in my career path. Do you know what I mean? Like, you have a bucket list, and then you live your life in a fairly reasonable, practical manner. I would say I'm a pragmatist. Like, so um, I think that, yeah, it wasn't ever something. It was sitting at the Grammys, like, winning an award wasn't something that I really ever thought about because I didn't think it was something that was, like, available to me or whatever. But I do remember um, <coughs> sitting with my mom. This is an embarrassing but sort of funny story. Um, 
and uh, Amy couldn't come to America, so she was on live satellite feed from Camden, you know. And, and this camera guy comes up to me as they're about to announce the award for record of the year, and it goes to the producer and the artist, and he goes, this guy's like, they got the cameras on every, like, the nominees, he's like, are you, you Mark Ronson? I was like, yeah. He's like, I thought you were an old Jewish guy with a beard. No. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, so I'm sitting there, and uh, they announce the winner, and they go, and the winner is, you know, Mark Ronson and Amy Winehouse for rehab. So I get up to, for my seat to go to the stage with this guy, cameraman, has led me to believe I should do. Why else would he have a camera on me? And as I'm kind of like getting up to the stage, I have like my foot on the first step of like the, wherever the Staples Center, you know, 5,000 people behind me in the room. And I start to see the screen coming down slowly and I'm like, oh, forge. So I realize like, wait, they don't want me up on that stage. It's going to be Amy talking. What am I going to stand next to a giant? projector for seven oh, no. minutes. Oh no. So I kind of like, I crumpled to the floor and oh, no. I just kind of had been in the front row crouched indiscreetly on the thing and I'm like, <laughs> I look up, it's like Kanye and Amber Rose, like I'm just like, I'm going to be here for a minute, don't worry. Um, and that was, and that, and that was it. But it was, I mean, it was fun. I mean, I would have been even more fun, like those kind of moments, like like I would have, you know, it would have been great if Amy had been there or we were there together, but I was there with, with my mom. It's cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it was a bit like being in like, synagogue on Yom Kippur because like, there's no food, there's no drink, and you've been there for seven hours just with your mom. Like, it's, it was a bit like that. That's what winning the Grammy's like. Yeah. Yom Kippur, right. And then you break the fast afterwards and you just go nuts. Okay, so you won your first Grammy, and uh, I'm assuming then the phone must just the phone must be going just red hot at that point. People yeah. just ringing you up, Mark. What do you want to do? There was a lot of there were a lot of people, obviously, because that record was so <coughs> well loved. But a lot of that record obviously had to do with most of it had to do with Amy and her songs and the chemistry we had together. So I kind of knew it wasn't like I could just go out and just factory like just work with a lot of people and I think in the, in the beginning too I was a little bit green I think now and I learned a little bit because I, I went on a bit of a not a tear but like I worked after that I worked on a bunch of projects like more passion projects and things that I thought would be great or maybe like this this band's not amazing but I could make them great and I realized that like you've got about a six month window where you can just be creative and do that. And if you don't have the same kind of, it doesn't necessarily have to be hits, but the same kind of important records to follow it up, it suddenly, it can dry up quite quickly. Yeah. And I think that's sort of, I realized a little bit more that it's like, it's great to do things that you know creatively that will indulge you, you know you can make great, but you have to also be quite smart about the projects that you pick and make sure that you're working with great people um, so I kind of like, after going a bit, doing a bunch of random stuff afterwards, um, and some of the stuff did all right, but really I kind of hit like another bit of a, I hit another dip, like another one of those things where you see your friends like hanging out there like, oh, did you get the call to work on Adele? I was like, no, did you, did you, get, you got it? Oh, right. <laughs> like you just see it because, like, you know, my friends like, we're all a tiny bit competitive, but we're all like, a lot of other, I have a lot of other friends who do what I do, and you're just like, you're aware that your stock is kind of dropping a bit. So I was working on my, so I had a record that came out that was, that did all right, but it wasn't uh, like necessarily a huge success. And then when I was working on my last record, Uptown Special, I had this, it was good, because I had this underdog vibe again a bit, and I was like, this thing, if I really want anyone to care, I want another 15, 20 years in this industry, this better be the best thing that I've ever made. And you obviously can't fully control that, but you can definitely, the work, the hustle, the people that you surround yourself with, you know, mix with that and just, just pushing yourself, I guess. This can be better, this can be better. Bruno's one of the people that I really learned that from. Bruno's just like in the studio, you know, it's just like, no one's going home until we perfect that drum sound or whatever it is. And like, it's like, it's like six in the morning, and everyone's afraid to show that they're a little bit tired, like sign of weakness, because then you're just like, um, but it's, I mean, that's pretty intense. But I did learn that it's, I think it's a little bit more of an, uh, that American sense, and the American industry has a little bit more of that like 
hus that kind of ambitiousness and a little bit more commercialism. Yeah, for sure, maybe. man. That's their, that's their whole thing. America's built off that. Yeah. So I think it was good to absorb a little bit of that, you know, but still make sure that I was, you know, making stuff that I could be proud of. And then, uh, and then... And then it did quite well. And then, it, then yeah, kind of the hard work paid off. I mean, way beyond anything that we could have expected because it's a bit of an anomaly to have a song like Uptown Funk and it was such a result of everybody's input and Bruno's performances and the video and just like, it was just this really lovely, perfect storm, you know. 14 weeks at number one. Yeah. On the Billboard 100 yeah. in America. 14 weeks, just to put that into context for you. There's, so there's only three records that have been at number one for longer. And they're Candle in the Wind, I Will Always Love You. And do you know what the third one is? I think it's like a Mariah Carey Boys to Men. No, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the Macarena. <laughs> no, I think, I, think we tied, I think we tied the Macarena. I thought you were going to be like 14 weeks. To put that in context, there's four weeks in a month. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, to put that in context, there are four weeks in a month. Um, so that's a very long time. Yeah, no, it's it's. Cra I remember the f I remember the first time it got to number one, and it was, I couldn't even believe it. Just of just one week, and 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 Bruno called me. It was like they tell you just the day before they announce the chart, and he had had a red probably had like three or four number ones already. He's like, he's like, it's just that rarefied air, like number one on Billboard chart because it's not a chart that strictly sales. You have to have like this perfect storm of like radio airplay. If you just happen to come out by accident the same week as Taylor Swift, like you're Forget screwed, it. whatever it is. Like yeah. it's just, there's so many odds against it. It's just such the, like a little bit the holy grail. And he was like, man, savor this. Cause this is like, you know, this is, you know, and it was just felt like quite, even he was quite moved by it. And it was nice to share that. I was like in the garden, like it, the dogs like barking and like trying to be quiet and sensitive on the phone with Bruno. But, um, and then, and then, uh, yeah, and then it stayed there. For four months. Yeah. Um, so then where, where, where do you go after that, mate? Because that's a lot. Again, you've, you know, it's, it's, never, uh, it's never easy following that up. Um, Obviously, it's a nice place to be. Yeah, I think it's, I guess it's just, I don't know if it's my own personality. I mean, most artists and musicians, even like successful ones that I speak to have the same thing, like, I think that the day that we had won the Grammys, like the day after I was reading the newspaper and I was like getting this thrill because I love the New York Times, I read it every day and there's this thing like saying like we won this, you know, the Grammy on the front of the art section or something. And then it was like by about six o'clock that evening, I was just already feeling like, man, I, you know, I'm, I've got no more good items in me. This could be a, uh, that soon everyone's going to find out I'm a fraud. Like whatever. Like those same feelings of like massive feelings of just being like feeling like uh, I guess those are the things that drive you. So they're good and they're probably not fully realistic either. There has to be some. But I always feel like I'm like four days out of like waking up in a trailer in Utica, New York. You know, I think that like, and it and it's that's obviously part of the thing that like I said, that drives me, so it's healthy. And then I think that also it's just... Were you able to savour it, all that success, and enjoy it? I th it? You can savour it for maybe 16 hours or something, I feel like. I feel like also... But what about being present? I think that present for me is like working on something new and exciting that's going to make me... So the idea of maybe dwelling on successes is, A, seems a bit just ego and like a bit vanity driven anyway and it doesn't do anything to propel you and keep you moving forward so it's very nice to look back and see an award on a shelf and be like oh cool that was great I we own that we worked hard for that but the idea of like I think it's also a, it's a human instinct you know there's nothing in in our biological makeup that does us any good by dwelling on something good that happened in the past. Like if you think about early man, you're like, is there going to be a lion around this corner? Not like that was so much fun. Not necessarily dwelling in the past, but if, for example, you're number one for four months, maybe you can have that four months and say, you know what, whilst we're number one, I'm going to have a nice time and I'm going to enjoy it and not be freaking out that I'm never going to be number one again. I know, I know. Because otherwise, what's the point, frankly? I think the point is to probably, there's probably like a, a middle ground there somewhere, you know? I think the thing is to, 
to to enjoy the successes to a point where you can sort of pat yourself on the back. But honestly, like, I'm always, I'm still excited always the most by the, the new thing that I'm working on, you know? So that idea of going to the studio every day, working with, whether it's like a brand new artist that's just making their first record or like somebody, a legend I've looked up to, like that, that is what kind of keeps me going. So I think I would just get Board. But I think I also have to learn. I'm sure. I'm sure, like it wouldn't suck to be able to enjoy and just sit still a little bit. But I feel like that, maybe when I'm like sixty. When you do have the beat, yeah. finally. Yeah, exactly. You can sit there and stroke yeah. it. Yeah. Um, do you go to the studio every day? I do. Yeah, I go. Well, I mean, I go five, six days a week. I mean, I do because I. I I live in Los Angeles now because I was going out there so much for all my work, and I always thought LA was somewhere that like people moved to to get soft and like be sellouts and stuff. But all of my work was there, and I was like, why am I basically keeping Flying British Airways in business? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I uh, I've been there for two years, and and there's a great, very vibrant scene there, and because film is there, and music, and songwriters, and artists, and stuff. So yeah, I go there every day, and I have. I have a label there, and I have my own artists that I'm producing, and my own records I'm making, and film stuff. So, yeah, I can stay. I can stay busy enough. I'm learning to not have to be so busy. Yeah. But because I was, I wanted to ask you what else you're into, but we we tried that, and there wasn't much else. No. no. I mean, I, I I mean, obviously, charity is really important to me. That's something that I've I do enjoy, and I do recognize that I've been fortunate to have the opportunities I had starting out and the success that I've had since. So there's a, there's a f few school programs like in kind of underprivileged schools now that I live in Los Angeles. I used to do work here with the Prince's Trust and some other charities and things like Ray of Sunshine, but there I, it took me a minute to find a place. So there's a school out there with this middle school, which I guess is secondary school, uh, where I've like kind of become a patron of their like music program. They come to my studio and we record and I go to the school and stuff like that. So those things are important to me and family. So I've got, I've got other things to do. It's not like I'm just like strictly work. Sitting in the studio fretting about the next yeah, hit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, we've had this huge hit. You, you also, oh, actually, let's talk about a little bit the last couple of years. So, uh, so since then, uh, Lady Gaga... That yeah. must have been that must be an interesting world to get into. She's got some of the craziest fans in the in the universe. That one. Yes. Yes. Do they get in, do they start getting involved in your life? They do. I definitely like. I uh, I was telling George backstage I could be posting something about like maybe really heartfelt or like a Martin Luther King Day like kind of like commemorative post and a picture of him and like at least twenty of my comments will be like. Tell Gaga to come to Brazil. Like, <laughs> it's uh, she has she has very rabid fans. But I've been really lucky, especially because the kind of artists that I've worked with, there's something about them because it seems like there's some passion and you know people like Amy and Lady Gaga, like people, their fans really feel like they're speaking for them. They're like almost like a voiceless people. It's like if that girl wasn't singing, no one would understand my pain. Um, and so those are the kind of fans that like really, really like fervent. So I've been lucky to like inherit like a bunch of those people on the way. And then of course there'll always be somebody that like you ruined Gaga, send her back to Red One because they you know they like the dancey hits and we made a record that was a bit more like songwritery. But she was amazing and working with her, um, I think that. There's a documentary about the making of the record that I've seen recently, and I realize how I probably realize now that I'm not working with her how crazy her life is outside. Because the music, especially for someone like that, the music is in the studio is almost a, their, their safe place, their sanctuary. So like that's what every time I go and she just come in and like just be ready to work and make music, and that's where she was truly kind of like in 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 like a joyful place and then I see like oh the minute she steps out of here into a car or like on a red carpet madness. life is madness so um, I got to see her very like she would like 
she'll be late to the studio and be like, what are, you, what are you doing? We're getting ready to start. She's like, I'm just marinating chickens. And she would come and she would like bring this whole, like serve like an Italian mama, like this, like everybody who worked in the studio make dinner for them and stuff. So she's like, she's, a, she's definitely like, she, I, I ate well. You I ate well. well. And that's the most important thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I feel like we might be time-wise. How are we doing? We all right? We good? Happy? A couple more minutes? Okay, so just before uh, we do uh, Q&A, um, <coughs> I wanted to ask you, I would imagine there's some young people in the room. There are some young people in the room. There will also be some parents in the room um, who are fretting about their children, you know, wondering what they're going to do and, you know, and all the rest of it. If you were to give advice to somebody uh, about how to get on in the creative industries, what, what advice would you give? I think that the thing that I did learn along the way, like I mentioned a few times, I guess, is that idea of like trying to find your own voice. I mean, obviously, you have to be aware of like if that's what you want to do as a job and stuff. There's certain kind of things like you can't just start making 27-minute songs and do, I just I mean in a specific way like if you want to make pop music or something like that, but at the same time. I, I, I guess the th real successes that I found is when we were doing stuff because we truly loved it and it felt, it was exciting and it was like, that's how you really try. I mean, there's, I'm going to get it wrong and I know there's like a lot of probably successful business people in here, but that's like the number one rule of entrepreneurialism. It's like, come up with an idea that you wish someone had thought of it already. It's like that kind of thing. I've always made music that like, I felt like was maybe missing on the radio or something that I wish existed that didn't. And I feel like that idea of really staying true to and keeping some sort of originality as opposed to following trends and, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak, I feel like that's the best advice that, like, that I've experienced firsthand. Right, so find your passion. I think find your passion and, like, don't be afraid to be, like, to stick to your, stick to to your, your voice. Yeah. It's good advice. Yeah. It's pretty generic, but I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, but, you know, it's ultimately, when you boil it all down, that's the real essence and that's the truth of everything, yeah. isn't it? If you're doing something you really love, that will resonate and it will come through and, and you'll end up sitting here talking about your five Grammys and your 50 million records sold and all the rest of it. Right. You know, and 14 weeks at number one. Yeah. Um, well, Mark Ronson, thank you very much, sir. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, have we got time for some questions? We do. And have we got microphones going to people? Or, or We do. Right, okay. So there's a lady down there with her hand up who's right next to the microphone. Hi, guys. My name's Alison. Hi. Um, Mark, I believe you are a massive fan of Duran Duran. Yes, I know. I, I recognise you. How are you going? I've <laughs> been <laughs> stalking you for years. Um, what I was going to ask is you had the opportunity to produce them on All You Need Is Now and you had a guest appearance on Girl Panic. What is it truly like to work with your idols? Um, that's true, yeah. I don't know how we did a whole talk about like my musical formation without talking about Duran. Oh, I guess we talked about Wild Boys. So, yeah, it's amazing. It's, you know, working with your heroes. That there's this thing of like the first day or two where you're just sort of like freaking out and nervous and you're like, I can't believe this happening. And then at some point by day three or four, if you don't start like doing a good job on what they brought you in to do. <laughs> You know, we've got a super fan in the building. Yeah, Get exactly. him out. Like, this isn't a contest. We want to make an album. But I think that they're also, they're really lovely guys and they're amazing musicians. And just, even if they weren't my heroes from a purely musical standpoint, it was a joy to work on that record. And I'm really proud of the stuff that we did. And then there's still these moments where, like, I'll be in the studio and I'd be like, I can't believe I'm telling Simon Le Bon to like sing that line again, but like change, you know, like there's just these sort of moments where you, they're like surreal. So it, it was, it was great. And I guess like during the making of the album, I did bleach my hair like Nick Rhodes. I think I sort of thought I was in Duran Duran a little bit too much for a minute, but. Uh, is it those, true that your first lunchbox at school was a Duran Duran lunchbox? It was a Duran Duran lunchbox. Right. And, yeah. Uh. And I remember my mom took me to, in New York to the place where they cut hair. And like literally like, the, like a bowl on your head. And I think I like took out a crumpled picture of like John Taylor from like a teeny bopper magazine. I was like, can you make it like this? He was like, 
sure, kid, like, in this cut. <laughs> and I remember walking and, like, being a bit sad, but, like, not wanting to say anything. My mom was like, what's wrong? And I was like, this is Nick Rhodes. Yeah. <laughs> you got the wrong this one. This is not John Taylor. Yeah. yeah. Right. Who else would like to ask Mark a question? Lady down there on the front, Jackie Cooper. Hi. Hi. Um, I wondered what you do if you get creatively stuck. What do you do to get that out? Um, I think that it does happen a lot, and maybe because I don't have a like a nine to five schedule to what I do. There's times when you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm feeling like the ideas today, but like the thought of just sitting home or not doing it doesn't, I mean, I think that's the kind of thing where I, I'll go to the studio a lot of times and even if you're just hitting a wall, at some point I feel like hour four, hour five, it might be something clicks. And maybe it's like something, a little bit of an idea that doesn't even get realized. It's like a seed of a melody or something on the piano. This is very specific to what I do, but this is the only way I can really answer that. Like, if I'm sitting in a studio and I've got no good ideas of my own, I'll probably maybe go online and download sheet music for like a jazz standard or something that's like a little challenging, and I'll make myself learn how to use it and just make myself how to learn how to play it. And out of that, there'll be two chords in there that'll trigger something. <laughs> so I think there's just like that. I guess the most normal answer to what you're saying is like, there's no shortcuts. Like you just have to keep at it, and it's like something will eventually like there'll be a breakthrough. Thank you, gentleman in front. Hello, big fan Hi. by the way. Thank you. Um, where do you think pop soul music is going to go next? Obviously, you had an extremely successful album with Bruno Mars um, singing the, the lead single. Um, can that kind of retro sound be popular now? And, and if not, where, what do you think um, modern soul music or pop soul music will sound like? I think, uh, I think we've always loved that kind of music. Like We were never necessarily trying to make like a retro record. We just love Bruno... You know, his dad was a musician. I grew up really in, like loving the musicianship and the horn arrangements and that stuff that definitely like you know nods to another era. I think that like soul music and especially with uh, streaming and Spotify, and you look at like what the numbers are on that. You can now have songs that like a lot of really interesting artists like SZA and Frank Ocean and soul artists that wouldn't get played on the radio are having just as big commercial success because of streaming you look now that they factor streaming into the charts and stuff so i think it's a really good you know everybody obviously when the streaming stuff happened all the industry people and all the label people started to freak out and be like oh this is the decimation of our industry nobody's buying records anymore but in some other ways it's really opened up the creativity a lot and now they're finding ways to sort of i guess to keep the money going to the artists as well so I th the, for that, I don't know the, the actual proper, proper answer to your question where I see it going, but I definitely see groups like, like SZA and groups like the Internet and people like that. There's like, it's like a very creative time for music right now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, go Gentlemen, just in, yeah, in that row. Um, in the old days, an aspiring artist might... Uh, and stalk you and put a cassette in your hand, a demo cassette, uh, but in an age of um, SoundCloud and YouTube, what would you recommend to an incredibly talented young artist like my daughter Sophie here? <laughs> Hi. As, how, how would you recommend somebody? Um, how would you recommend somebody like her? You know, get above the. Uh, yeah. As, as your hand went up, sir, she started cringing. She just her head started to go down. Um, I think that exactly what you said, like YouTube and like people send me like DMs and stuff on Instagram with a link to their music and like I, I don't always get to check out every single one but I really try and check out most of it because I've, I have found some great songwriters and artists that way. Um, I think that 
like we were saying, like the thing about the internet and what it's enabled people to do as far as putting out their music on SoundCloud and YouTube and things like that is really is great. And then I also still think some of the old school um, things of playing out live, like that's definitely becoming a bit of a dying art. So I, re I really encourage all the artists that I work with to like, because that's why Bruno and some of these people are so special because you're like, when you see them, the fact that they can still dance on stage and perform and do all these things that used to be like, you used to have to be able to do, you know? Um, so yeah, I would just say like, well, how, so how long, do you have music out that you put out already? Yeah. And what is it, where do you put it out on? Uh, cool, and how's it going so far? Yeah, it's kind of like how I was feeling in that moment. And then I just thought, oh, I'll just put it out, and it actually did really well. But Great. What's your, what is it? How do I find it? What's the name? <laughs> um, I'm Sophie Damasi. Sophie Damasi. Yeah. Okay. D-E-M-A-S-S-I? -S D-E-M-A-S-I. -S okay. 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 okay nice work, that. Dad. Okay. <laughs> All right, we can go now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a gentleman with his hand up in the, the middle there. You, sir, yes. Hello. Thank you. Um, I guess kind of following on from most of those, what, what's next for you, I suppose? I mean, um, for me? Do you have... What's going to get you to the big beard and the Rick Rubin kind of state? Uh, I don't know. I think that it's funny because I was... When I was working on the... Lady Gaga record, we worked on it in his studio, Shangri-La, this legendary studio that used to belong to the band, you know, Bob Dylan's band, the band, and, and you're in Malibu, and it's like these beautiful trees everywhere in this amazing studio, and I started to think, like, this would be pretty nice, huh? And then, like, Google Rick Rubin Net Worth, I'm like, ah, a little far away from that. <laughs> but I definitely think that, uh, uh, to get back to your question, I think that... I'm trying to, the reason I started this label, I have this label and we have our first artist, King Princess, that we just put out, this amazing 19-year-old singer-songwriter. I guess the thing is to find the way to funnel some of my stuff in the talent to the next generation of talent, I mean. So the idea of building a label and a publishing company and fostering new talent, realizing like I'm not always going to be like the hot guy and the, just the idea of not maybe wanting to be in the studio till three in the morning for the rest of my life. So. Trying to find that kick drum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so I'm still in this you know, phase where I do love being in the studio, I love being around artists, I love writing songs, I love producing records and stuff like that, but I'm also thinking a little bit like realistically about the future and building something that, um, in that way, so yeah. All right, maybe last question. Gentleman up there with your hand up, with the glasses on. You, sir, yes. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. And Thank your you. your warmth and personality really comes through. Thank and you. you've been very generous. Also, you've liberally um, thrown out a few sprinkles of your Jewish identity. And since, since we're in JW3, I can't help asking the Jewish Chronicle question. And particularly, is to, to what degree do you think your Jewish identity has had an influence on you? And when you see in the creative community artists who boycott Israel and that kind of thing, how do you feel about it? How do you deal with it? Um, I think that because both from a religious and a traditional and actually like a spiritual point of view, it's, it's pretty hard for me to remove any part of what Judaism, it seems pretty ingrained. So whether it's values or whatever it is, I think that it's probably, it's probably affected quite a lot of my career because it's influenced who I am you know, as a person. <laughs> Um, I, I've, I've, I haven't had too much experience with anyone asking me to. I've gotten into discussions with other artists, some of them Jewish as well, about who, uh, about when I go and play in Israel. But um, it's never a thought to me that I wouldn't go and play there. You know, like those are my people, and I have family there. And I, if that was the reason, then you wouldn't play China, you wouldn't play Russia, you wouldn't play America. You're not playing for policy of playing for uh, people. So, um, 
Yeah, that's it. I love going to Israel. We have some of our best shows there. Uh, it's really strange. It's funny. When you go there, the first time we went, we were playing two nights at this place, and it was probably like 600 capacity venue. And it was like a week before, and we had sold 70 tickets. And I was like, what the hell's going on? Like, we're supposed to be like, like this is just a tiny place anyway. And I thought, it seems like people are excited. But because in a lot of the time, they don't actually really believe you're coming because so many artists canceled like before. And that seems like a pretty Jewish thing anyway. Like, I'll believe it when I see it. So, so we got there and the show, we got there like two days before and the show sold out and we had to add like a second show on both nights. So, and the, it was at this small club and we've gone back and played at bigger places since, but that, that's always remember, like in my mind one of my favorite gigs we played.